This is Pro Electrician number seven. Chapter seven is about boxes and conduit bodies. Some of the technical terms encountered in this chapter are listed here, as well as the objectives. Caution, electrical failures can cause insulation to overheat or arcing between conductors are more likely to occur at connections. Enclosing the connections within a box helps to prevent electrical failures from causing fires. The code requires all conductor joints, connections, taps, and splices to be housed inside approved enclosures. Boxes provide protection from both fire and shock. Article 314, outlet device, pull and junction boxes, conduit bodies, fittings, and handhold enclosures contains the code rules in this area. Enclosures, conductor enclosures support conductors and separate them from other building materials. This prevents flexible conductors from moving and provide some protection from electrical fires. There are several types of enclosures listed on the right side, left side of the screen are first box. A box is an enclosure designed to house electrical connections, junctions and taps. Boxes are also used to mount switches, receptacles and fixtures. You can see that on, on the uh, figure on the right side, 7-1. A conduit body. A conduit body has a removable cover that provides access to the conduit system. Conduit bodies are collect, uh, located at junctions and endpoints. They are used primarily for pulling wires, but are also useful for making splices, taps, and installing devices. You can see that on the right side of the screen, 7-2. <coughs> Enclosure. Electrical equipment must be enclosed to prevent personnel from contacting energized parts. An enclosure is a device that accomplishes this purpose, either a housing around the equipment or a fence protecting large equipment. NEC notes 300.14 at least 6 inches or 152 millimeters of free conductor shall be left at each outlet uh, junction and also switch point for splices or the connection of fixtures or devices boxes although there are some exceptions a box is required wherever conductors are spliced and connected Boxes serve as pull points and the location of conductor terminations. So figure 7-4 shows an example, although not so clearly. There are numerous types of boxes. They are classified on the basis of shape, size, use, and material. Figure 7-5 shows four of the most popular shapes. Round boxes. Round boxes do not have a flat bearing surface on their sides. For this reason, they are not permitted if the wiring method requires lock nuts or bushings to attach to the box sides. Cable clamps within the box can secure BX and M and M and or NMC cable. Wiring methods requiring lock nuts and bushings, such as conduit, can connect to the bottom of the box. Where the lock, where the knockout is provided. Round boxes are often used for mounting lighting fixtures. NEC note 13, uh, 314.2 Round boxes shall not be used where conduit or connectors requiring the use of lock nuts or bushings are to be connected to the side of the box. Octagonal boxes. Like round boxes, octagonal boxes are primarily used for sealing outlets. They are also well suited for wall mounting, for hanging fixtures, and for junction and pull boxes. 
Square and rectangular boxes, generally referred to as device, receptacle, or switch boxes, square and rectangular boxes are normally mounted in walls. The rectangular boxes can be ganked, that is, joint side by side or side to side to create more space for additional devices and conductors. These boxes, as well as the round and octagonal boxes, can be installed in wood frames, concrete, tile, walls, stucco, and brick. Utility boxes. Utility boxes, also called handy boxes, are rectangular with rounded, smooth corners. These boxes are normally surface mounted. The rounded corners make them safer than square or rectangular boxes. Metal boxes. All metal boxes must be grounded. The equipment grounding conductor of the branch circuit is simply connected to the metal box by a clip or screw. Figure 7-6 shows a good example of this, which we'll show here momentarily. Metal boxes are approved for most, most wiring methods. NEC note 314.4, all metal boxes shall be grounded in accordance with the provisions of Article 250, except as permitted in 250.11, 1 or I. That was, excuse me, 250.112.I. Uh, Non-metallic boxes. Non-metallic boxes, boxes are only permitted with certain wiring methods. Open wiring on insulators, concealed knob, cap or concealed knob and tube wiring, non-metallic raceway, and NM, NMC and other non-metallic jacketed cable. Non-metallic boxes can be used with metal conduit or metal jacketed cable if there is an internal bonding means between, the, between all entries to the box. Box mounting. Boxes may be installed in walls, ceilings, floors, partitions, cabinets, and other surfaces. The mounting surface can be almost of any material or composition. Boxes should not be concealed or inaccessible. Boxes may be mounted directly on surfaces as long as there is ad adequate support. If the wall surface is concrete or wood, this is not a problem. If the surface material is inadequate, then the box must be mounted within the surface, supported by a structural member or fixed with clamps. There are a number of ways to mount a box within a wall, ceiling, or floor. Adapters and accessories are available to aid in mounting boxes. Expansion anchors, bar hangers, and mounting brackets are often used. See figure on the screen, which illustrates some of the more common mounting devices. Threaded boxes with a volume less than 100 uh, uh, cubed inches or yeah, cubed inches may be supported by conduit alone. Two conduits threaded wrench tight into the enclosure are considered adequate support. Figure 7-8 on the screen illustrates the maximum spacing between the box and the nearest conduit support. Boxes and enclosures can be mounted using nails or screws. If nails pass through the interior of the enclosure, they must be located within a quarter inch of the end or back of the box. If a box is located in combustible material, it must be installed flush or project from the surface. If installed in a, in a non-combustible material, the box may be set back a quarter inch from the surface. See figure 7-9 part of which is shown on the screen. Conduit bodies. Conduit bodies allow access to the system at junction and terminal points. Figure 7-10 shows many of the different types of conduit bodies available. Conduit, conduit bodies are used in several situations making 90 degree turns in a conduit run, pulling cables into a wiring system, splicing conductors, making taps from feeders or branch circuit conductors. The code, the code point out that capped elbows 
service entrance elbows, and similar fittings cannot contain splices, devices, or tabs. Conduit bodies are subject to the same code rules as the boxes with regards to filling, splicing, tabbing, and device installation. Very few conduit bodies have adequate volume to accommodate splices, taps, or device installation unless they are oversized by two to three times the largest conduit entering the conduit body. Conduit bodies that are not marked with their capacity cannot contain splices, taps, or devices. Boxes and conduits or conduit bodies must be, la must be large enough to provide adequate free space for the conductors entering and exiting. If the enclosure is too small, the ambient temperature around the conductors becomes too hot. This weakens insulation and increases resistance. Carefully read section 314.16 C2 to determine if a splice or tap is allowed in a conduit body. Section 314.5 specifically forbids splices, taps, or devices in short radius conduit bodies, capped elbows, and service entrance elbows. Enclosure sizing, outlet boxes, device boxes, junction boxes, and conduit bodies must be of adequate size to allow for free space for all conductors within the box. Conductors should never be tightly cramped or bunched into a box of inadequate size and volume. Cramming wires into the box can damage insulation and create the possibility of a ground fault or short circuit. Pull and junction boxes. When four AWG or larger conductors are contained in a raceway, the size of the pull and junction boxes is determined by the size of the raceways. The minimum pull box size is determined differently for two types of pulls, straight and angular. For straight pulls, the length of the box must be at least eight times the, di the diameter of the largest raceway entering the box. Figure 7-11. For angular pools, the box size calculations are a bit more involved. The distance between the raceway entries and the opposite wall of the box is equal to six times the largest raceway diameter on that side plus the sum of the diameters of any other conduits on the wall. Also, the distance between the raceways having the same conductors must be greater than six times the diameter of the larger raceway. This is illustrated in figure 7 dash top of the screen. In either case, the depth of the box must be sufficient to allow for the largest conduit, its lock nut, bushing, and spacing between adjacent conduits. Conduit bodies. For a straight pull through a conduit body, the length of the conduit must be at least eight times the diameter of the raceway. Figure 7-13 on the bottom. The angular pulls through LB, LL, and LR types. The long dimension of the body and the distance between raceway openings must be greater than six times the raceway diameter. However, the distance between the raceway entry and opposite wall along the short dimension can be less. The minimum distances are shown in section 312.6a, b, and c of the code. For this, see figure 7-14 on the screen. Outlet and device boxes. Section 314.16 of the code contains requirements needed to adequately size outlet and device boxes containing conductors smaller than 4 AWG. Figure 7-15 is a reproduction of table 314.16a of the code. This table lists the maximum number of conductors permitted in standard box sizes. The conductors are various sizes are contained in a box, the volume of the conductors must be added.
Figure 7-16 is a reproduction of Table 314.16b of the code. It shows the volume assigned to each conductor size. This table is also used for non-metallic boxes. When determining the number of conductors contained in the box, other components are also counted as conductors. The following guidelines are illustrated in Figure 7-17 on the right side of the screen. Each conductor entering the box and being terminated, terminated or spliced is counted once. If two conductors enter the box and are spliced together, each conductor is counted. Conductors that pass through the box without being terminated or spliced are counted once. A conductor that does not leave the box, such as a grounding pigtail, is not counted. Internal cable clamps are counted as one conductor, regardless of how many they are. They are assumed to have the volume of the largest conductor in the box. If a clamp is located outside of the box, no allowance is needed. Fixture studs and hickeys are counted as one conductor regardless of how many there are. Just as cable clamps, the allowance for, for the largest conductor is used. Each yoke or strap containing the device is counted as two conductors. The allowance is based on the largest conductor attached to the device. Equipment grounding conductors entering the box are counted once. Regardless of how many there are, the allowance is based on the largest conductor or the largest equipment grounding conductor. If an additional set of equipment grounding conductors is present, a second allowance must be included. Boxes containing conductors for AWG and larger must conform to section 314.28A and section 300.4F, which contain the criteria for pull boxes. Moving on to the sample problem, 7-1, the first one of the chapter. The problem is a non-metallic seated cable to AWG with 112, uh, excuse me, that's 12, uh, two 12 AWG with 112 AWG ground is connected to a receptacle. Another identical cable extends to another outlets. What size box is needed? The solution for the problem, the conductor count would be as follows. Circuit conductors, in this case are four. Grounding conductors, one. All internal clamps are counted as one. And finally, the duplex receptacle is counted as two. Total of eight. So under the 12 AWG column of the table, that is table 314.16A, we find that either a four by one and a quarter square box or three by two by three and a half device box would be acceptable. Sample problem 7-2. A switch and a receptacle are to be installed in a box. The receptacle has 12 AWG conductors and a, the switch has 14 AWG conductors. The grounds are 12 AWG and cable clamps are present. What size box is needed? The solution, the conductor volume would be as follows. Four 12 AWG conductors or four times 2.25 uh, cubed inches. which equals a total of nine cubed inches. Two, eight, two 14 AWG conductors or two times two cubed inches, which is four cubed inches. All grounding conductors is counted as one times 2.25 cubed inches or 2.25 cubed inches. One receptacle strap counted as two times 2.25 cubed inches or 4.5 five cubed inches, one switch strap, counted as two times two cubed inches or four cubed inches. And finally, all clamps are counted as one times 2.25 cubed inches or 2.25 cubed, inch, cubed inches. You add all of those items, you total 26 cubed inches. So therefore, having a minimum capacity, a box having a minimum capacity of 26 cubed inches is required. This is referring to table 314.16a, a 4, 11 and 1 16th 
or 411 and 16 times one and a half square metal box will be suitable. A non-metallic box with a minimum of 26 cubed inches would be equally acceptable. And the review questions for the chapter are here provided, one through five. Do go through them as you see fit. Some of them just have the page and paragraph included, which you can go back through the text and check those out and verify. Here are the questions six through 10 with their respective answers. Please do review if needed. And here are the problems for the NEC uh, using the NEC section of the chapter. Again, a very important uh, section to complete to make sure that you become familiar looking for information in the NEC, whichever version you may be using. Remember, we are using 2011 or later for these uh, sections, for these lessons and series. Do pause or rewind the video as needed. You've reached the end of the lesson. Thank you very much. I do look forward for the next lesson. Good luck.